and welcome to the first of the video lessons on the style inside the course. Um, nothing in this section is deliberately or directly tested, although a lot of this will serve as background information to help make future sections make a bit more sense. We'll be making reference to ideas, areas and concepts which will be hard to understand exactly where they and where, where they came from and why they are the way they are and why things happen the way they do unless you know a bit more about Russia. So obviously this is to be combined with the reading um, in the, the Edmodo or Google Classrooms um, to add flesh out and we'll be focusing a lot on the core concepts which students find sometimes difficult um, about this course when moving forward and this falls into two broad categories questions about the nature of the Russia and its state its geography its economy and questions about the nature of communism and it's that latter one we're looking at first because communism is something students often believe they know about but actually don't know too much about at all um, particularly in the Russian context so communism or socialism and they are distinctive things essentially views the world through what we call a materialist lens materialism is actually quite a common idea and actually i believe many, many of you listening to this will have some degree of materialism to your thinking this is the idea that people and people's behaviors people's thoughts people's actions are conditioned by their social and economic circumstances i.e if you are raised in a certain economic or social environment you will behave a certain way now that seems quite uncontroversial but if you take it to its logical extreme you can start making arguments about how behaviors are often common to certain classes you can or even make suggestions that you can predict how people will act if you have this stressor this factor say you've been born in a slum or you have been given a university education you will always generally act within these parameters and so that's really what makes communism the idea that we know and love today. That's the idea that essentially human behavior should be seen as the result of economic power relations, economic situations, and someone's experience within the econo economy, as opposed to the more liberal point of view, which is people's individual agency, individual actions, then affect how, where and where they sit economically. So this is very much a... Um, there is less free will, less to zero to no free will, uh, and material circumstance defines a lot. Now, if you take that um, uh, as a um, idea, then you start thinking the world as um, and understand the world as a series of classes. That's the idea that people of a similar material experience. Now, this is more common in Marx's day when there were generally fewer in between jobs and there were um, there's much more stark inequality so the working classes were vastly different to the middle classes who were vastly different to upper classes and everyone in, within those bands had broadly the same experience um, this is the idea therefore that these groups these classes working classes peasantry middle classes upper classes bourgeoisie whatever you want to call them um, all share the same broad social and economic situation so their exposure to education their exposure to working conditions there are opportunities in life and so on how they understand the world how they treat others people above or below them is all basically the same I, if you get to get a working class man in london and one in paris there'd be some obvious differences in language and culture and behaviors but at its core the 80 percent their their way of thinking about the world their way of acting would broadly be the same in similar environments to as the, someone across the channel um, whereas someone who is in London and middle class will often be very 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 different much more different um, than a working class person in London than say a, working, a middle class person in France so the idea the thing that essentially that makes you you makes you make decisions makes you think makes you feel makes you act isn't some magic voice in your head or a soul it's your class because it's from that you've learned your moral compass you have learned your attitude towards work you've learned your behaviors and so on and so what socialism and Marx argues is when you have these separate classes and these class conscious classes which is where classes realize their own situation <coughs> then what you get is class struggle because what's going to happen is you're going to have one class at the apex or at the top who will be doing very well and another group below it or many below it will be doing poorer and as 
um, the classes which are underneath the dominant class um, struggle and fight for the resources, be them economic, social, or cultural. Um, so they will. This will create something known as class struggle. Okay, and in an extreme form, class struggle is revolution. But class struggle is any fight between it doesn't have to be physical fight for resources or power within a political situation, which is all about getting more of the means of production, more of the economy, more of the stuff, as it were. So, um, communism therefore says these classes, which are made up of broadly similar experiences, broadly similar ideas, um, will operate in certain ways now this is what we call the historical di uh, dialectic because what marx argues is there's an inevitable scientific approach to understanding um how the world has evolved and this is this um chart here now if you can't see it here this has also been uploaded for um on the sort of various emoto google classrooms so you can follow along at home um, this is a very crude and actually quite incomplete summary, but essentially what Marx argues, Marx is a historian first and foremost rather than a political thinker, and he looks at the past and he um, was relatively revolutionary, not hugely, but relatively revolutionary to understand events in the past not as the role of big important men making important decisions sort of maps and chaps intentionist history but understood the world as far more being forced by structural forces i things which affect people's behavior are un, are hidden are unseen uh, people often aren't even aware of that's what's shaping their behaviors and very often indirect so this can be the economy um, money ma um, and the and material wealth affects people's experience of the world and how they act what marx argues in this historical dialectic is history is a series of stages and you can see each of the stages on the map there i'm pointing at my cursor now okay and what he argues is there was a couple sort of before um, feudalism which we won't get into but essentially she argues that each stage one class is dominant and that class has the political power and because it has political power it also has the economic power so in the case of feudalism you have a monarchy with its aristocrats its lords think about the feudal system in year seven it's lords and knights at the top who control the land the means of production um means of production is the way you get money the way you get wealth who controls the means of production they control the um power because they control the money and they will always try and keep their own power and what they argue what he argues is over time this works but they're increasingly, as you get the classes underneath, you see a struggle from the classes underneath the rich upper classes, the aristocracy, um, for control over that um, those limited resources. And therefore, we see a revolution. Now, what Marx points to is the French Revolution is a classic example of this. You have an absolute monarchy, Louis XVI, um, who is who runs through the nobility power is on the land and he uses fear repression and um, force um, the church basically to keep everyone else the middle classes and lower classes in line now what marx argues is as we have industrialization as we have sort of proto-production and we see a rise of the middle classes from about 4 1400 um, ad to roughly 1700 ad what we have is you have a group of people who in the middle classes whose attitude towards the work the lower classes um uh, the peasantry is quite negative they believe these people are stupid these people are servile and so on but at the same time want to be br want the sort of power the money and they want the control or at least want part of that as of that the aristocrats currently have and what you have in is the middle class gets bigger and bigger and bigger because of industrialization and technological change and the sort of jobs that go with that sort of engineers lawyers doctors uh, businessmen factory owners those jobs tend to be more middle class so what you have is with technological change you see a rise in this middle class but they don't have any power and because they don't have any political power they don't get access to the money and they don't get access to the wealth. They might get a little bit here and there, but they don't get control of it. So the argument is what we'll have is, and what he argues the, the French Revolution is, is as the middle class increasingly want power because of the material benefits that brings, the upper classes will fight them for it. And there's all this sort of tension and he looks into the tea leaves of the past and looks, sees, sees a little bit dubiously uh, instances of pre-fights um, between the two groups. And then he argues at a certain point, 
um, there's inevitably going to be a revolution where the middle classes rise up, often using or borrowing the strength of the working classes, but controlling it as a leadership um, to overthrow the upper the upper classes and the um, uh, kings and the and the elites and become the new people in power. And that would move from the feudal idea to the capitalist era. Okay, the capitalist stage. Now. This is the idea of a middle class revolution, if you can see here. Okay, middle class revolution. The revolution is the middle classes. They've come over, they've taken power, and now they are um, running the country for their own interest. So the government tends to reflect the interests and the needs of the liberal middle classes who are now in charge. Um, that tends to be more democratic, or at least on the surface, and more liberal. And the way you make money reflects the changes in technology. Money ceases to be about land, it becomes more about factories. Now, what Marx argues is, in this very revolution, the middle classes, the bourgeoisie, um, sow the seeds of their own destruction. What that means is that capitalism relies on you to be able to sell stuff cheaply. Selling stuff cheaply lead, needs um, low wages for workers um, and also needs longer hours for workers. And so what we, and what capitalism creates is competition because if one factory can squeeze more work for cheaper out of its workers by paying them less, making them work harder, giving them fewer breaks, treating them as harsh and whatever, then it will make more money than the other factory who is nicer to its workers and the other the nice factory where it gets eventually go out of business and so what marx argues is essentially is capitalism is sowing its own seeds because in its very creation it will start exploiting the workers it will start making the conditions of workers worse and worse and worse and eventually what will happen is as the demand for workers pulls people from the countryside to the cities to become, go from peasantry in the countryside, who Marx often thought were quite docile and stupid and really weren't very revolutionary. And they move to the cities where they're more close together, they tend to be slightly better educated, their conditions are more extreme, their relationship with the elites are slightly more distant and less. Um, what happens is... Um, these working classes will increasingly become class conscious. And what that means is they are become aware of their exploitation. They become aware of their power. At the same time that capitalism, in order to get more and more profits, increasingly exploits um, the working classes. And what he argues is, is the new battle in the next stage isn't between king and middle class, but it's between the exploited working classes and the bourgeoisie and that leads well, eventually to inevitably scientifically according to Marx the socialist revolutions where the proletariat the working class primarily override um, and take over the um, bourgeoisie take control of the factories and then control the state um, and therefore what we have is a new what is called a socialist revolution a revolution where now it is a proletariat in power and the power of the middle class has been pushed away. Now, what Marx argued was essentially this does not necessarily lead straight to communism. There is a stage in between called socialism, which we can see here. Okay, Socialism um, is a transitional stage. Now, in reality, Marx is quite vague about how long that would take and every communist um, says that they are doing socialism in order to get to communism but are always very vague about how long it's going to be uh, and the argument can be made we have seen socialist government but not communist government that's quite a common argument amongst communists themselves although one could contend um, on the other hand that is this possible that is a debate for a different time and place okay but what Marx argues is this communism is an, is an, a time where there is no state. There is no um, economy. Essentially, the argument is that people, in their natural setting, are sharing. They are um, socialised. They have a natural social nature. And they have more in common with their fellow man than opposes them. And so, in the ideal state of nat nature, i.e. before man has been corrupted by capitalism, by greed, if you just took early man, they worked well together. And they say that is our natural point. But what happens, particularly in the capitalist phase, but even before that, is that natural goodness, okay, has um, been corrupted by greed, consumerism, ideas of race, ideas of gender. Each communist simply slightly different what corrupts you, but essentially you have been corrupted. 
<coughs> and so what this means is um, that um, if we were just to say get rid of the state and get rid of uh, money, people will go back to that sort of greedy behaviours they've learned in capitalism. Um, a good example of uh, way to think about this is if you imagine an air cr a crash in the Andes Mountains, a sort of a very high mountain range, it doesn't matter where, but a high mountain range in South America, um, and you have a plane full of people who are in a capitalist society. Now that their survival is needed, they are they ha in when when they're, this has happened in the past, they tend to work well, very well together, and they tend to be very socialised, very organised, and that's our natural nature coming through. Now. What Marx wants is to go back to this natural nature. That's what communism is. That's the idea. We don't need a state because why would you need to organise people and control people and bully people if we can't regulate? If we can regulate ourselves anyway, um, you don't need any strict organisations. Everyone is um, equal. People will produce goods um, for the benefit of everyone. People will work together. Okay. Now we might be thinking that and going, well, but people will obviously try and be lazy. People will obviously try not to work hard. And Marx would say, no, no, no. You say that's obvious, but that's because you've learned the capitalist way of thinking. And yes, people taught by capitalism to be greedy, to do as little as possible, they will certainly act that way. But he says, before capitalism, and even before that, people worked together. That was their natural social nature. So we need to go back to that. But before we get to that beloved communism, we need to reorientate the society. We need to recon reconfigure society. We need to change how society operates, how the economy operates, how people think. Because you can't change behaviours overnight. You can't change how people think overnight. So what we need is a state socialist transitory stage a stage where essentially we get socialism and a dictatorship of the proletariat which is a dictatorship run by or at least for the working classes um, in order to tear down capitalism take the money from the rich give it to the poor re-educate people reorganize society improve the economy and so on do all the things you need to eventually get to communism now <clears throat> this is obviously a very big, very big, hard ish thing to do. And communists often are actually socialists uh, who are saying, well, we are doing these things the purges, you know, the Great Leap Forward, um, the um, move back to the countryside collectivization, um, not because that's communism, but because that's what the step we need to do um, before um, the. Uh, move to communism. So a good example is Stalin in um, the 1930s will take everyone's land um, and put them on collective farms. These are massive farms owned by the government where everyone works together. Now that is the government having a huge role. That's the dictatorship of a proletariat. And that's not communism. Communism there shouldn't be a state at all. That's socialism, a very strong um, state. But what Stalin will argue is, yes this is socialism, but if we take away everyone's private property and we build these collective farms and to make everyone work together. That might be awkward for the first 10, 20, 30 years, but over time with the new generations, that will become natural and will help move that transition um, over to communism, okay? And in that transition, every t as the people increasingly can be trusted to work on their own, work together nicely and so on, the government will become smaller and smaller and smaller because it will need to do less and less and less. And in Marx's words, it would wither away. Okay, so the argument is of communism, therefore, people are controlled by their economic situation, their behaviours, their actions, their thoughts, and their process. It's actually a relatively uncontroversial idea. However, this means that people who are similar in the economic situation will think similarly. And that's where we get classes, who people who think broadly the same way, um, despite racial, um, uh, gender or geographical differences will think probably the same way and what will happen is these different classes will fight amongst themselves over time until we get to socialism and in socialism we will see a strong government often brutally um, at times and there was space for brutality in, um, in Marx um, force and reconfigure reorientate society so that eventually com people's natural nature comes in so that's the ideal the first thing we need to think about is you'll notice there's an inner rail here. That's because in reality with Lenin, this situation is not necessarily the case. In, 19, <coughs> in 1902, um, Lenin will essentially, sorry, 1903, um, Lenin will 
um, split the then Social Democratic Party, um, Social sorry, Social Democrat Labour Party, um, which was then basically the Koch Socialist Party of Russia, um, in two. And his half, the Bolsheviks, will argue that actually this process can be speeded up. Now the problem is this, okay? And the problem they were facing 1903 is this, okay? Um, essentially, Russia is, by on the face of it, not a ripe country for revolution. It does not have the advanced capitalism. It does not have huge amounts of businesses. It is not wealthy. It doesn't have. Most people are peasants. Remember those docile, lazy, weak peasants. Most people are. Le- um, well, most middle classes are very, very close friends with the upper classes um, because they're too scared of the lower classes. And therefore, actually, um, this has not happened yet. So how the hell can we get to here? Okay, down to social revolution if we've not even got capitalism yet. Now, what the Mensheviks, the minority, although that actually they weren't in the minority, but they were called the minority because in the vote they were the minority in 1903, okay, um, argued, and that's a very conventional socialist view, is we need to wait. Marx is right. Follow the book, okay? We need to wait until Russia becomes capitalist, and then we shall encourage a socialist revolution. Lenin agrees the middle class is weak, agrees it's largely um, isolated working class and largely rural population. However, he argued that Russia was more likely to have a communist revolution. Okay, um, This is because the idea that um, the, um, uh, the <coughs> state itself is fairly weak. Um, uh, a capitalist state like Britain had a strong welfare system so it was able to keep its working classes happier by buying them off with some health insurance and some medical insurance and some um, pensions whereas the cap russian state was very very weak its russian state was far weaker militarily in, in terms of police therefore was less likely to crack down on working classes less likely to crack down and so what lenin argues is actually we're in considering how weak and basically feudal the russian state is now we could we could actually bypass capitalism entirely and get straight to socialism and this caused a massive argument the bolsheviks or majority although they weren't the majority um, majority um side of lenin and they say we are going to have marxist leninism which is we can speed up revolution okay um whereas the mensheviks argue no no we're going to carry on we're just going to wait the 20 to 30 to 50 years um, it takes for capitalism to develop and then push for socialism. Lenin's argument against them were, well, you're just letting people be oppressed for 50 years, which is unideal. Okay, so Lenin's argument is the state is weaker, its police are weaker, its military is weaker, its ability to look after its people are weaker, therefore people are angrier, more revolutionary, more violent by in general. Okay, economic problems um, uh, tend to be more extreme in Russia because they're more dependent on the um, agriculture and farming, which tends to, whenever there's a bad harvest, tends to mean that everything gets destroyed really quickly. Um, the um, he also argued that the peasantry, because they are naturally more socialist and sharing, i.e., they don't do capitalism, they don't do buying. They t- on the from an outsider's point of view, they look like they're very sharing and caring and socialist. Actually, they're incredibly brutal and corrupt. But that's a separate discussion to have later. Um, that they are naturally communist. So he says actually the Russians, because they are weaker, because they are. Um, um, more economic chaotic because this government is hated more because there's more chaos because there's more negativity it's easier for socialists to take power in russia than say a more advanced country with a good police force a good welfare question system to keep people quiet um, labor a labor party to keep people quiet in like britain so he argues that actually we can bypass the capitalist stage Okay, this is often called Leninism or Marxist Leninism. Um, now he, ar- he he argued that this would not be easy. This you, what communists would traditionally do is they'd wait for the cla- the the workers basically become class conscious on their own. Maybe give them some leaflets, and then once they come class conscious and revolution starts, they would then encourage it in the right direction. Whereas if you're going to speed up this process you need to be more active you need to actively attack attack the state bring down the state make the state fire into workers so that the workers then get angrier you need to actively get people involved you need to actively inspire people through speed up requires much much more work and effort at a quicker space at a sort of pace 
So what Lenin argues is what we need is what we call a revolutionary vanguard. That's that second bullet point. Revolutionary vanguard, vanguard means like advanced party, is a group of highly trained, professional, working 24-7, well-disciplined, well-controlled, completely organized, completely doing what they're told, series of professional revolutionaries, people who will do what they are told to organize the masses, to inspire the masses, to organize revolutions, to organize problems, to create that circumstance where people will take on the government. Because obviously they won't do it themselves because they're not fully class conscious yet, but they can be made to. So this in reality becomes a major split. And a lot of what the communists are going to do, and particularly Stalin is going to do, can be explained as the um, approach, particularly in this socialist stage. We look at the brutality of what Stalin does, the sheer size of the state that he has, the sheer control he has, and go, well, how can he be communist? Well, perhaps he's not being communist, but he is being socialist. And it's important to understand what are they trying to achieve? Is this power for its own ends? Maybe, probably. But are they at least trying to sell it as something broader? Yes. They're trying to sell it as this is a stage. And therefore, communism in the Russian context should be seen as a very, very, very zero-sum, extreme, relatively organized, relatively centralized approach. Because if you are going to A, advance the economy, and B, advance revolution, because to get to this stage, you basically need to skip out this both to get workers angry, and then build the sort of city um, urbanization it, um, number of factories for this to work to here that requires a much bigger government that requires a much more disciplined government that requires more brutality and we can argue by rushing everything both rushing the revolution but also this requires loads and loads of factories loads and loads of people organized loads and loads of um, re-education that to speed that up in a way that means you can't wait for this will also take lots of time, lots of effort. And therefore what we see is not sort of Russian communism is almost always trying to get stuff done quickly and therefore tends to be more extreme, more centralised, more controlled because it is trying to force something through. And because that's their sense themselves, because they see themselves with that, they don't tend not to stop themselves when they are being a little bit extreme. They, they get in that very much, you've got to make a cracker through eggs to make an omelette mentality. So, that's the first thing, the communism in the Russian context. The second thing is to look at a bit more of the economic and social background of Russia. Now, Russia itself can be divided into two parts. Now, we're going to look at this map in more detail here. Okay, and a lot of this we'll come back to later. The, draw a imaginary line about here. Okay, between the Caspian Sea and here. That's probably more like here. That is a Ural Mountain. Okay, Ural is R. Sorry, U R A L S. Ural Mountains or the Urals. Okay, this side is known as European side. Historically, under the more European-facing. Um, czars such as Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, um, a lot of the culture, a lot of the art, a lot of the approaches, a lot of the mentality has shifted this way, okay, and therefore a lot of the architecture, a lot of the capitalist mentality, a lot of the um, weight liberalism and the way of thinking and the more technological and social advancements tends to be in this side, and you'll notice the majority of major cities tend to be on this side as well, okay, that is the European side, but Russia also has a massive, much larger Asiatic side, okay, Asiatic side tends to be more ethnically Russian or in many places ethnically not Russian at all, particularly in these areas here which have been recently conquered in Russian parts. And there therefore tends to be two large parts of Russia. We have the places which tend to be relatively more westernized here, economically and socially, and then these places here, far more rural, far more um, poor, far more alien. That's going to be a problem if you are based in Moscow and are trying to get a control over this whole region. There's almost two different cultures here. Okay, Take northerners versus southerners and move, sort of turn that up to about 100, and you've got that same sort of idea. Technically, they are all Russians, but there's a vastly different identity, and almost people judge each other based on that identity. Next thing to know about Russia is, as mentioned before, it is not an urbanized city-based country. 
most people, the vast majority of people live in the countryside. And this isn't the countryside eh, like the suburbs of Moscow. This is places like here. People where the the next, most people will, will live and die within five miles of their home. Most people will not see a police officer. Most people in this region here, under the Tsars, assume he's some sort of god figure as opposed to real man, because where else are they going to get the information? Okay, Russia is incredibly rural, incredibly isolated. There's very little because it's so poor as a country, and so because it's so backwards and big. You have one railway going about here, the Trans um, Siberian Railway, and then basically mud roads. And therefore, in reality, there's very little control outside of the cities and around the, um, the cities and along the Trans Siberian Railway. Very little control by the government. Notionally, there is someone in charge, a governor, who is generally a local landowner. And under the um, communists, there's a local party. But because they're so far away, because there's no like telegraph system, there's no roads in many places, um, it's incredibly hard to get control over it. And start going to spend loads and loads of time and money including killing millions of people to try and get that control and he will never manage it in reality it's a it's yes you have cities but the vast majority of what of uh, russia is a massive wild crazy background place with very little central control the average peasant will, will not really care about the government because they won't ever see a policeman let alone a politician okay and so what we need first to understand that this is not a developed country this is a country with one or two major cities St. Petersburg and Moscow in reality the only ones of note Kiev maybe but that's Ukrainian based although it's in Russia and tends to be very very anti and hostile to, um, to the Russians and therefore very hard to control and then hundreds of millions of rural people who have zero connection to the wider world that's going to create huge problems when you want to rapidly industrialize the last thing is this these statistics here okay um there is huge ra um, uh, racial and ethnic diversity in Russia. The um, Russians are in a minority, as you can see, with the 44% um, in 1913. Essentially what Russia is and the Rus are a region around here, oh, a region around here, um, uh, which then slowly over hundreds of years grew and grew and grew and grew. It, Russians controlled roughly this area here. Outside of that, you had a huge range of different religious and ethnic groups who were not Russian, from the Finnish to the Baltic states, the Lithuanians, Latvians, and so on, Germans, Poles, Ukrainians, Ukrainians, Crimeans, Caucasian, uh, Caucasians, Georgians, Armenians, Iranians, Mongolians around here, um, various Muslim groups down here, etc. Going on to the more Asiatic groups and um, Eastern Asian groups here. Okay, huge, and the sea bears here. Okay, huge, huge re racial variation. The, the, the Russians that did exist were obviously very much focused around here. Okay. Now, in reality, that diversity had been largely left as it was. There had been attempts to Russify or do Russification, which is when you force these people to act and think more Russian. That's probably not a stupid idea in the longer term. In a hundred years, if you force people to wear Russian clothes, destroy their old language, kill anyone who argues and get rid of the old tribal chiefs and destroy their religion and make them have Orthodox Christianity, then in a hundred years' time, that will probably be good for stability. In the short term, though, that created loads of violence, chaos and revolutions, which the weak Russian state could never do. So although it tempted attempted to russify and make people more russian in reality it tended not to achieve it and just annoyed people more than anything else so there's huge diversity and huge variation but in reality not much control and what that means is you have a state which has a core economic and this is broadly an uh, ethnic center where the, the this this area here largely is homogenous ish and tends to be a bit more wealthy and controlling a huge rural religiously ethnically culturally variable group all of which resent russia and the russians and so what we see is in reality a state which is deeply weak inherited by the russians and inherited sorry inherited by the communists so the russian economy therefore is 
incredibly flawed and its politics are incredibly flawed um, because it's reliant largely on rural um, and uh, rural wa wages and rural agriculture it's incredibly poor the average peasant farms in the same way they have done in the 1300s because there's no state voice because there is no mobility because the culture is so backwards looking in the present amongst the peasantry they use such old techniques and such inefficiency they just about feed themselves okay um let alone feed anyone else um and that means food's really expensive so you don't move to the cities that means there's no workers and also because there's the country's poor there's no money going around to build factories and therefore it perpetuates itself because everyone's now working in this in the countryside and there are no jobs or no opportunities or no ability to create businesses in the cities so what we have is loads and loads and loads of rural workers and if you're trying to sell agricultural goods abroad you're pretty much on a wasted waste of time because one thing every country can make is its own food so if you try and export food if you get any money for it at all you're not going to get much at all and what also means is when you have in particular region as cold and as um geographically variable as russia famines as the harvest fails you then not only have a loss of the money you do get but huge social and economic chaos and unrest and violence as the food prices rise as people starve and people blame the government and so on so in reality the economy is incredibly weak and backwards <coughs> which creates political problems and what we have therefore is because food and um, there's very little money to invest in um factories and um, the Russian people tend to be very backwards looking and um, there's very little urbanization and industrialization very few factories with a very very small working middle classes with only Petrograd Kiev and Moscow the only real major cities and between that there's basically no infrastructure very few few power lines minor to no railroads basically no roads picking no paved roads across an empire which the one thing you need to be able to do if you want to control it is a huge amount of communication and therefore Russia is this rural, poor, unurbanized, backwards, um, poorly linked up uh, country at the when the, the communists come to power. And culture itself is incredibly atomized. What that means is um, divided up there's not people don't think they're russians people think they're from a small town here and they hate the guys in who the town next to them um the idea that everyone's one people in a situation where you have this much um sort of variation ethnically anyway is is terrible but you're taking the fact that yes you have 44 percent of people are russians but those most of those russians are people who have lived in the same village for the last eight generations they don't even really like people in the local town let alone a major city and everyone tends to look out for their own family and their own village and therefore there's not this sense of let's work together or the sense of bigger picture or the sense of what the world is bigger this is real in my village this is what we do and we've always done it this way and this is how we do very backwards very uncultured and therefore very unwilling to see change or do new things that will be a problem going forward when we see stalin trying to make people do stuff and therefore what we have is at the eve of revolution a uh, revolution a, a system where we have a czar who is at, on top um, who runs through use of brutal, brutal torture um, secret police um, violence and basically leaving people alone if they don't rebel <coughs> um, in charge now obviously that someone as weak as the czars because weak as nick II can't rule themselves so they are kept in line by the army who obviously will shoot anyone who do what you say um the church who in return for lots and lots of money at the very top ends of the church the patriarchs of the orthodox church would tell the poor and tell the peasantry and tell the working classes that the czar believes in them the czar has been anointed by god so don't rebel so you almost use this sort of mental uh, don't say brainwashing but you know that mental indoctrination that mental support for um the russian state landowners um and the bureaucracy tend to be the same people they are the nobility the rich um, landowners the bureaucracy the civil servants tend to be the second sons who can't inherit land and they will run the local area they control and they almost run it like a feudal king i'm um, sorry a feudal prince what that means is they are in charge of their area they can do pretty much what they want no one's gonna be looking over their shoulder and they're like the mini chief the mini mini king of that little area and so long as they the taxes go up to the government or at least some of them do and there's no rebellions no one's going to complain 
there is a very small working class, very small middle class, and a very small um, and a massive work peasantry. Now, the peasantry, you would think, because they are poor, they'd be revolutionary. Because the average peasant hasn't seen outside their town, and they believe that the the, um, uh, the czar is basically a god. Um, it's hard to get them to rebel because they don't know anything else. And if you tell the sort of peasants, oh, we're going to make ch make change for the future, we're going to have factories, they're very suspicious of you. And more than that, the average peasant won't actually ever speak to someone outside the city, um, so outside their village. Um, you're not gonna, and you're not going to drive 2,000 miles to some random town um, in the middle of the Siberian Urals to have a conversation about Marx. So in reality, the peasantry tend to be really reactionary, really, really, really... Um, uh, uninterested in revolution and so long as you don't try and make them do anything or try and tax them uh, which will then usually mean that the person sent to tax them will get strung up on the tree um, then they pretty much get left alone so what we have is a state which uses a lot of force but actually is very very weak because it's so poor because it's so badly run because the people who are in charge of the army the bureaucracy the, um, and the church and land owning are all there just because they have to be born there rather than because they're good um, they tend to therefore become really 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 weak take that on top of the economic problems industrialized problems poor communication atomized culture chaos it's inevitable that you're going to see a rise in revolutionary music movements now we care about the bolsheviks you do not need to worry about any of the others for this course, so if you do, you'll be, they will be mentioned later. But all you need to know is the Bolsheviks were the small, smallest, or amongst the smallest, of a number of different groups. <coughs> the, um, the Mensheviks, obviously we mentioned before, um, uh, the socialist revolutionaries are socialists who are far more focused on the countryside than the towns. Bolsheviks tend to be very much interested in the towns. That's how you get organisation. That's how you run things. They are all urban people. They're all actually middle class intellectuals. They tend not to like to go to the countryside, and they don't see that you can force a revolution in the countryside. You force a revolution in a capital city where you're close to leaders and you can get rid of them in a night. Um, social revolutionaries tend to be socialists, but focus much more on talking on the sort of farming side, giving people free land, and they tend to be better, more popular amongst the peasants. In a country where the vast majority of people are peasants, they have an advantage. There's also anarchists, no state, and various nationalists of various different groups, as well as a small liberal co um, contingent, including one group called the cadets. Now, what happens, and this is none of this will come up on the exam, what happens in February 1917 is essentially after three years of World War I, where all these problems we've mentioned, under the stress of a major war where millions of Russian peasants get killed because of the inadequacies of the generals who are all noble morons, the economic problems which are already bad made a hundred times worse by the fact that all the money is going on fighting a war on top of the um, food crisis created by the fact that all the people who are working in the, in the farms are now in the army and then therefore are going to get food and all that stuff and the fact that the country is so badly run essentially the czarist government implodes and it destroys itself and, therefore, and it becomes unable to pretty much run anything um, and what happens is a strike gets out of hand and it, one thing leads to another and although the strike had no intent of creating a revolution by the end of the day in February, the uh, monarchy has fled and resigned. And that's called the February Revolution. Now that's when the, um, essentially there is this revolution by accident. So weak is the Tsar that when people start shooting at, um, uh, at protesters and they carry on coming, and then some of the soldiers sent to protest to shoot the protesters turn on their leaders because they are also peasant poor people who don't want to go and fight and die in World War I, um, that the country basically implodes. But because it happens by accident, there are no leaders. No one knows who's in charge. Basically, what's happened is the government's been forced out. Everyone spontaneously pretty much got rid of the, the government. But no one knows who's in charge. Into this void, he, he steps in a, the middle classes. And they try and create a dem democracy. Uh, uh, a sort of liberal democracy based around the, uh, universal franchise and um, individuals sort of running the show. Now, that works fine for about two days and then the problem with the middle classes is that because the vast majority of Russians are not middle class you have people in charge who have a world view about what should you do about land what should you do about World War One? what should you do about food who are massively at different odds with the um, 
uh, working classes and peasantry. So, for example, being liberals and capitalist middle classes, they don't want to take the land of the rich landowners and give it to the poor, whereas the average Russian wants that to happen. So what happens over the next few years, sorry, a few months, is as the war drags on and as the middle class liberals are unable to deal with the sort of things that people care about, with the socialists and nationalists and anarchists and so on, all saying, actually, we can do this better, we can give you free land, we can end the war and so on, um, the um, government becomes less and less and less and less popular. So, what ends up happening is the middle class group, um, uh, government becomes incredibly unpopular, and in October 1917, the Bolsheviks seize power. You do not need to worry about the October Revolution. All you need to know is there's about 600 people involved, and more people are killed in the film making, film about the October Revolution, than in the October Revolution itself. The October Revolution, had they been up against any government which was popular amongst anyone would have failed. It was a complete disaster, chaotic shambles where everyone, sh- all the communists end up shooting each other by accident and all this sort of stuff. However, because by October the middle class government is so unpopular, no one's going to die for it. So when the Bolsheviks get onto the streets with their guns and stop shooting each other for a little bit, all the soldiers have already left their place. And what is the government if the people defending them with guns have let gone home? And so what ends up happening is the leader um, uh, of the provisional government, the sort of liberal government, ends up fleeing. A guy called Kerensky ends up teaching at Yale in the end. Um, and it's it basically by accident, again, the communists have taken power. The Bolsheviks have taken power. However, the problem they've got is this. Okay. The liberals... In February 1917, had promised in November an election. And the communists had taken power in October. Now, they had taken power not because they're popular, but because they happened to be on the streets of St. Petersburg with guns and no one wanted to fight back. Yeah? So they've taken power, but they are not the majority. And you've got all these other socialist groups, all these other um, right wing groups, and all these other. Um, uh, liberal groups who are looking at the Bolsheviks going we they didn't like the old guys we didn't like Kerensky so we're not sad that you got rid of them but you better not be seizing power or we will destroy you and so Lenin is essentially forced to um, uh, allow the elections to happen and when the elections come out you can see the results there the socialist revolutionaries, the social, this is despite huge rigging and huge controlling and a far more disproportionate vote than they should have got because of all sorts of skullduggery. Despite that, the socialist revolutionaries get the vast majority of seats because they are the socialists of the peasants. And the peasants are the most common group. This is a problem. Because this means, in theory, Lenin should give power. But Lenin can't, doesn't want to give power. But Lenin also can't say no because he's not strong enough yet. What ends up happening, okay, is Lenin basically tries to buy off, despite the election happening in November, he needs he keeps telling people, we're just making a transition, we're just making a transition, we're just making a transition, we need to get stuff organised, we need to get the constituent assembly organised, things aren't organised yet, and tries to put off the other parties from allowing them to sit and the government to meet. And for a series of lying, tricking, deceiving... Uh, bullying and so on he manages to push off until January in the meantime he solidifies his control over the army he gets control of the guns he brings in censorship he brings in lots of popular laws and decrees which basically give people free land gets rid of titles ends the war and all this sort of stuff okay and he particularly makes sure communists are in power in areas where the um, uh, government are have coercive power, i.e. the police, the army, and judges, and so on. And so in the two, two months after the November election, the communists, despite not being popular, not being voted in, not being um, liked, have got control over the violent parts of the state. And then what they do is they shut down the constituent assembly. And they say, you can't meet. The reason he feels confident in January rather than October is in October he's just taking power. He can't start a fight. By January he's got control of the guns or at least enough of the guns to start a fight. Then he shuts it down. 
Now this triggers an appalling civil war. Now, <coughs> this civil war is an absolute shambles. This is not a civil war between organised, modernised forces of elite people. This is a knife fight between uh, a in a country where everyone is poor and doesn't know how to fight and doesn't want to fight. A knife fight between about six to eight different groups. What ends up happening is the Bolsheviks control the centre region with all the factories and that's their already start advantage. And what they have is they get attacked from pretty much every side. Um, from uh, groups um, from foreign uh, countries such as Britain and America, from nationalists such as the Finnish and Polish who want their own country when they see if remember, they were technically part of Russia in 1913, they want their independence now. You have attacks from what is known as the Whites. The Whites are the upper class and middle class representatives of Russians. These are the rich and powerful who've lost all their money and their position with the loss of the Tsar and now want it back. Now the Whites technically have all the generals. They have all the money. They get given a lot of money by the government. But being Russia, just because you're a general doesn't mean you're good. It means that you knew a guy or you happened to be born in the right place. As well as that, all the whites, each major general kind of wants to be leader themselves and doesn't trust any of the others. So though you have this massive army on paper full of generals and money, people don't want to fight and die just so we can go back to the time of the Tsar. So they find it very hard to keep their soldiers from deserting or running away as soon as shooting starts. But also they don't coordinate. Um, and they don't know really how to fight. And so what happens between 1918 and 1923, although it's largely done by 21, okay, <coughs> is a um, Russia gets hit on several angles. The Bolsheviks get hit on every, several angles. And essentially, um, the two dominant for, um, uh, forces end up fighting between themselves. Both sides... Um, the whites who are split up and the reds, a colloquial name for the communists, although they're also fighting other, uh, uh, like the social revolutionaries for a time, okay? Um, you have generals or people in charge who really want to win. The rich upper classes want their positions, their titles, their power back. The communists who are generals genuinely believe in communism, genuinely believe they're doing something great. The average rank and fire foot soldier, however, doesn't care either way. They've usually been fighting since 1914 in World War I. And now you make them fight for more? They all run away, they all don't care, they all... They, neither side's conscripts tend to care. As well as this, because they're so poor, both sides tend to have very unskilled leaders who don't know what they're doing, don't know how to fight, don't know how to organise, and as well as the weapons are very poor. So this basically becomes like whoever can be marginally better, whoever can centralise, control and organise and have a strategy of the resources that you do have, the limited resources that you do have, those who can keep control of their troops and make sure they stay in the field and don't run away before the other side, to those who can ensure people who are good get promoted and people who are not get fired, and those who can best use their technology and their resources effectively will win. Now, a lot of this is won by the, the communists because of one man, that is Leon Trotsky, a man we'll talk about later. What Trotsky does is he becomes commissar for war. And as commissar for war, he leads the Red Army. The Red Army is a name for the Bolshevik army. And through that, he completely controls resources. He has brutal discipline. Those who run, he is happy to have executed. Those who flee, he is happy to have executed. However, he also makes sure that, that propaganda is there, they are well fed, and they are well resourced. Those commanders who know what they're doing are kept in line and are promoted. In fact, Trotsky will even allow old bourgeois and upper class generals and officers to fight and lead so long as they are, they are good. Now he holds their families hostage and should they run away, their families will be executed. But he is happy to allow poor and um, the sorry the enemies of the upper of the working classes the, the rich the middle classes to run the army in the short term at least in order to win the war he also makes use of the central position using the railways here the few that they are to shov shovel troops over here concentrate them here fight this guy and then shovel them back down here and concentrate and fight this guy and then concentrates over here and fight this way by using co 
the good communications by using a well-organized, efficient, logical use of the resources and troops that you have, propaganda, terror, or um, a clear organization and clear control, he is able to make sure that they win. Okay, uh, and that's vital for the war. Now. This will be by getting control of the strategy, by keeping soldiers in the field for by, by carrots, rewards, promotions, propaganda and so on, and stick, fear, violence, terror and so on, um, and also making sure the limited weapons and resources that they use are, are, um, are done effectively, as well as making sure that these areas here are, are producing as many guns, as much food as quickly as possible through something called war communism which is a very brutal economic system of control, complete control of the, of the government to force people to work exact, as hard as you want, which will cause problems and we'll talk about them next time, okay? They're able to win the war. Now, this has a huge impact on the Bolsheviks themselves because you have an already centralized, disciplined, brutal, coordinated, elitist party who, in order to win the war, become more brutal more disciplined, more centralised, more controlled, more extreme. And so what we see in the Civil War is that initial instinct, that vanguard elite conspiratorial instinct, becomes more pronounced and the Communist Party becomes weirder as a result. And it's that Communist Party that we will start with in two lessons time when we look at why do people come to power. So the things this has, number one, it leads to the renaming of, of themselves to the Communist Party in order to try and appeal, appeal to the masses to get them to work and fight for them. As well as this, mo it, is it is not lost on the Communists that in the cities they have control. They have their secret police, the, the, people, the, people, the working classes in the towns, as few as they are, tend to be more organised, tend to be more similar to the Communists and therefore more like to listen and respect them. And whereas the peasantry tend to run away as soon as they can, tend to hide food, tend to not care about either way, and they just want an easy life. And this really reinforces an image um, amongst the um, uh, communists that the r r countryside is backwards and bad and anti-communist and the city is good. And this encourages them to treat the rural areas really poorly in war communism as a result. It increasingly becomes violent. <coughs> and justifying violence um, as something which is necessary to stop the counter-revolutionaries, as a, something necessary to protect the revolution from those who wish to see it destroyed. And therefore, because violence in the civil war becomes more normal, they find it less negative to use it to in other purposes as well. So they are less scared of using violence. Violence becomes more normalised and therefore that will shape their attitude towards violence even after the Civil War. As well as this, the war, because it becomes about control, centralisation, control from a centre, organisation, this gives power in the central, the leader of this party, i.e. Lenin, and also Trotsky's war commissar's hands. And this really creates the Communist Party, which technically should not have a leader because they are all meant to be equal, in increasingly have a clear leader. <coughs> this also creates the idea of the idea of democratic centralism for this period. We'll talk about factionism next session. But for now, in the civil war, you can't afford to have people disagree with you. You can't afford there for there to be a debate. You can't afford for there to be argument. And so, at the same time, communists in theory are not autocrats. They share ideas. They have a conversation that was equal. But how do you simultaneously have a debate while also not allowing a debate? And the answer is democratic centralism. Democratic centralism is the idea that you are not allowed a debate in public. However, within the Communist Party, until something has been resolved or it has been decided, you are allowed to have a conversation about it. <coughs> now, that's going to be really problematic later for reasons that we will see. But for now, we need to work out is that this encourages that idea. As well as this, in order to fight the war, you need a bigger government, you need a centralised government, you need people in offices keeping an eye on, you need to keep it in offices writing reports, checking on things, organising things. As the party needs to get bigger to create and win the war, that will stay with it. It will stay big. Once people have jobs, they don't want to lose them, they'll find some another reason to keep them. And therefore the party becomes more bureaucratic more controlled, larger, wider, more about office work and filling in forms. As well as this, in order to win the war, the party basically
basically gets control of the army, the country, um, the infrastructure, the control, the um, uh, various ministries such as foreign ministry, economic ministry, agriculture ministry, and uses that to win the war. But as a result, by the end of the war, the the state, the things which technically belong to the government, not the party, end up all being controlled by people who are members of the party, who have been put in that position by the party, who take orders from the party. So although technically, yes, you have an army, technically you have a minister of agriculture those people in the army particularly in senior levels of the army are do, are there because they're communists and they will do th- the things as told to by the communist party in their ministry so the party increasingly increases that gets their power over the state um in reaction to the um, minorities trying to break away in this period, in the Syrian civil war, there's increased reinforcement of this idea that Russians are better um, and rejection of minorities, which would be a problem. Some working class individuals do get better, do get promoted, particularly if they're in the army, and that does lead to some social change. And it does encourage a split in socialism as the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries start by fighting the communists and even after they stop fighting the communists in order to beat the whites um, they are always going to be on the outside but it does mean that the Bolsheviks who are now the communists have control so what we have (coughs) in this story is three things we have a communist ideology and we explained how that thought how that thinks what that is because that will shape a lot of how the next 20 years turns out we've talked about the um part in russia and its background how poor broken impoverished um politically weak politically fail economic flail it is and that's also going to be a problem in the future and lastly we talked about the party itself and how it's been changed by the civil war that will shape how things get decided what fact happens who wins a power struggle why stalin can't be removed so again, all three elements will not be put in the test, but they are part of understanding how do we get to the point in 1924 where things are run this way. We're going to look at another lesson about that and then that idea um, next um, lesson. Um, we're looking at the back, a bit more of the background between 1921 and 24, and then we'll start on the essay question. Until then, I'll see you in the next video.